Jesus. Would you grab your swords, please, and turn to Romans 12. Glory. How many of you know there's a great thing going on? There's a great awakening, great exposure. Things are becoming more and more evident that God is revealing himself. There's going to be a process of him revealing himself more and more and more and stronger and stronger and stronger. Light is going to increase. It's like one of those three-way light bulbs. You know, those start slow, they get lighter and the brighter and brighter. Yeah. So when you get one of those fluorescent global with God's presence, it's going to rip everything apart. People are going to fall on their faces and worship the king. Romans 12, verse 1. Let's go to it. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? Present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. So you're going to be a living sacrifice of praise. Amen? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your responsibility or reasonable service. Yes. And do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your thoughts. In other words, aligning your thoughts with the thoughts of God. His words. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That perfect will means perfect choice. Everyone say perfect choice. That perfect choice, resetting your way of thinking by willfully choosing the way of Christ rather than the way of man. Amen? You have a choice. God will never force you. He'll never force you. Amen? But he has a way of manipulating certain things to eventually cause you to say, okay. You know, it's amazing how many people... You know, they get sick, they get a disease, something happens, a chaos or whatever, and it's like, you know, I, I get calls many times, and, oh, we need prayer for such and such. Well, God got your attention? Like, why, because you're sick? You're in need of something? You know, God got your attention? See, chaos always brings attention to God. Amen? Always. Even the atheists, when they get in trouble, they go, oh, God, you know. Hallelujah. <laughs> there must be a desire to want to change. Does everybody get it? It's called the will to change. That means you must make that choice. You must have a desire to change, not just one time, but every moment. Every challenge brought to you is an opportunity to change. Believe me, most of the time the devil's not even coming at you. You bring it on yourself. If everybody blames the devil because everything they sowed, they're reaping. Amen. Oh, the devil did this. Oh, no, he did. You opened the door to it. You agreed with it. You opened your mouth. Hello, you did something. The enemy's just trying to get an open door to you. But we bring it on ourselves most of the time. But again, there's got to be a place where you are not only willing to change, but you desire to change. So every circumstance comes across your path, no matter what it is, even if you get in a car accident. Somebody hits your car. doesn't mean you get out and react. Amen? It doesn't mean you get vengeance on the person. It's an opportunity. Even when you're sick, no matter what happens, things happen. Look, we're in a fallen world. Amen? Welcome to the earth. Things are going to happen to us. But it doesn't mean that you got to change the wrong way. It doesn't mean you have to react and allow the flesh to take over. You must respond to the workings of Christ and everything that happens to our life. Everything. Amen? So you got to ask yourself, am I willing to change? Do I have a desire to change? Or am I still battling and making excuses to change? Refusing to change. You know, one of the things I can tell when a person's willing to change is when they make stupid mistakes and they repent. See, when you don't repent, you ain't willing to change. 
If you got caught doing something stupid or made some mistake, amen? And God's saying, what do you got to say? If you say nothing, you're not willing to change. If you say, I repent, forgive me, now you're, there's a desire to change. Because repentance is the open response to say, I am willing to change. You know how many people get caught doing something because, the, and they're sorrowful because they got caught. But they're really not repentant. So without repentance, you ain't going to change. That means you're not willing to change. And you'll stay the same way and repeat the same stupid thing. Hebrews chapter 3. Everybody's willing to change when first salvation comes, when they're in chaos. Then the thing is, is it begins to drift. Again, we must be willing to change. We must have a will to change in everything that comes across, our, every circumstance that happens. Hallelujah. You think the world is changing? Yeah, they got no choice. But you can do it willfully, <laughs> or you can do it struggling. Hebrews, chapter 3, hallelujah. Hebrew, did you brew? Hebrews, chapter 3, and verse 7, please. A few pages. Glory. Let's speak it. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years, therefore I was what? Angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we do what? Hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said... Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in rebellion. You know, refuse. <laughs> as you, when you refuse to hear God, it opens the door to the enemy. Because what does it do? It hardens the heart. And when the heart becomes hardened, rebellion is always the fruit of that. Rebellion is always a fruit of that. Remember, your heart is the core of all your desires. And what happens is when rebellion starts, the individual begins to drift and losing the way of Christ and confidence in his faithfulness. And they begin to trust in their feelings, their emotions, their desires, their abilities. So now their focus is more on themselves than it is on the Lord. Why? They must have a will to change. There must be a will to change in everything. That individuals, those individuals will lose the will to change. And then when, why does someone, how do, you, how do you tell that? Well, they begin to blame everybody else for their stuff. Because they're not willing to focus on their shortcomings, their own stinky fruits. Psalm 37. Everything that is shaken can be, sh that's going to be shaken is shaken. And everything that's going to be solid, God will establish. Why? Because he is bringing across everything possible so that he's looking for the genuineness of his children. Amen? The genuineness. He's looking for genuine people, not fakies. There's those who want to be and those who will be. 
Psalm 37, verse 3, please. Psalm 37, verse 3, let's speak it. Is everybody there? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his what? Faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. In other words, when you're delighting in the Lord and you have a will to change, your heart changes. Now, your heart's the core of all desire. Now, your desires are not according to yours. They're according to his. So why? Because that happens because you're saying, Lord, what do you want? What, what pleases you? I want the desires that please you, not me. Amen? It says, verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall what? Bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently to, for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways and because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, and do not fret. It only causes um, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Whoa, -ho. they shall, in what's he saying? Feed, eat, digest, delight on his goodness and the goodness of his promises. Commit everything to him. And uh, the, God sends opportunities to change. Amen. So commit to the opportunities of change to change. Trust every challenge that God and know that he sees and he knows, allowing him to have the last say through obedience, and he will change you <laughs> in the sufferings of your endurance. He'll change you. Remember, sufferings always bring an opportunity to change. In Hebrews 12. You know, think about what you just went through the last year. Did you allow those challenges to change you? Amen? Aligning yourself with the likeness of Christ? Or did you allow those challenges to align yourself with the likeness of the devil? Hello. Are you true? Are you honest? Or are you manipulator? Hebrews 12, 3. Is everybody there? Hallelujah. Let's speak it, please. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become what? Weary and discouraged in your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, imagination. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. You have not forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons and daughters. My son or daughter, do not despise the what? Chastening of the Lord or the correcting of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure the chastening, God deals with you with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we've had fathers, human fathers, who, who corrected us, and we paid them respects. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Oh, interesting word. Trained. Those who have been trained by it. Yes. God corrects and directs 
those he loves, to set them on course of victory, blessings, and favor. To allow the chastening to come all the way through. It's not punishment. And so many times people think that they're being punished instead of being corrected. God corrects. He doesn't punish. He punishes the wicked. He doesn't punish the righteous. He corrects them. He chastens them. Amen? And what's it going to do? It's for your training so that you become a better person. And until you become that at place where you're, the will of change is constant for you all the time. You're willing to change. Why? You want to be better. You want to be more pleasing to God. Amen? Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, please. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught ab abounding in with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Can, we are completed him through cooperation and obedience. God will not change you without your will to change. It is a choice that you and I make. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Let's speak it together. Therefore, what? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Whom he may devour. That's very simple. Cast your cares because pride is trying to prove self. Pride is always trying to prove yourself. People don't like to cast their cares on the Lord. Amen? It takes humility. To, humbleness is denial of self. Denial of self abilities to rescue yourself. There are areas that need to change. Let go and let God. Amen? That's why you're to cast your cares. People who try to fix everything themselves are prideful. But the word says, seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. Don't get me wrong. It's not about helping someone. You can help people and things that are need. But when you're dealing with yourself and you're dealing with challenges and certain things, and there are certain things God is saying, will you give that to me? Quit trying to fix it yourself because every time you put your little paws in there, it gets worse. Amen. Everybody's gone through that. Especially with vehicles. People try to go out and fix their own vehicles and they don't know what the heck they're doing. Boy, did they make a mess. I should have called, even plumbing, whatever it is. I should have called a plumber. I should have brought it to a mechanic. <laughs> you know? What you should have done is too late now. That's why you should have cast it on the Lord and get counsel from the Spirit. Amen? Which way do I go, Lord? Hallelujah. Too many people go to the phone instead of the throne and they get themselves in trouble. Or they make the wrong call to the wrong person and get themselves in trouble. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your what? Sanctification, your separation unto him. That you sh should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor and possess his own tongue. <laughs> not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is avenger of all such. And as we also forewarned you in testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to what? 
holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. This is the will of God. In other words, this is his choice for you. Whether you cooperate with it or not, this is your opportunity to say, Lord, I'm willing to change. To know how to possess your own emotional desires, fleshly outbursts, <laughs> controlling all of them, not allowing them to manifest. Your thoughts, your soulish desires, your intake of things. You know, many people don't know how to take possession over their own diet. And if the devil can't kill you with sin, he'll kill you with what you eat. You know, we've just gone through a whole thing. And, and, and I'm going to share with you just a simple thing. Sugar is addictive. And it promotes the spirit of addiction. I see many people fall back into the same old addictive mentality. They react. They need a fix of sugar. It's a killer. There's so many good other things that can be replaced with. But people can't, they don't have control over it. If you're a sugar and addict, you're still an addict then. We just played videos today just to expose things. It talks about how amount of sugar is just like cocaine with endorphins and so forth and whatever. We need to put that up on the eternal library so people can go look at this. I'm telling you, the enemy is ter wiping out people with sugar. Well, look at the end result. Obesity, uh, uh, um, diabetes. People are losing parts of their legs and arms and going blind. And they think it's okay because it's been going on for so long. It's been inherited. But God is trying to clean us up, man. We, we got we to gotta run the full course. Amen? And there's so many healthy replacements of it. And you can still get a sweet fix with a healthy one. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Believe me, I have a freezer full. Proverbs 23. Now, you know you can't avoid everything, but, man, if you, if you do a low carb and, and, and no sugar, you know, because there's things that are in whatever, man, you, you'll think better, you'll feel better. And you'll lose the life preserver. That's a lie. It actually causes you to go, flip over in the water. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 23 and verse 1, please. Glory to God. Is everybody there? Bear with me. My new Bible has very skinny pages. <laughs> okay, verse 1, let's speak it together. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. Now, a ruler usually has lots of money. Amen? And put a knife to your throat if you are a man or woman given to appetite. And do not desire his delicacies, for they are what? Well, snap. They're deceptive foods. Look how much sugar is put in everything. It's a deceptive food. In fact, it's a cursed item. Why? Because it promotes death, not health. Now, this is not a diet teaching program, but we've got to bring this up so people get an understanding. Amen? Hallelujah. Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding cease. You will set your eyes on that which is not. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. And do not eat 
the bread of a miser and desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. Deceptive foods are cursed items. They come in many forms, shapes, tastes, liquids, frozen, cooked, or crunchy. They are sugars with gift wraps. Deceptive gift wrap to promote sickness and addiction. Hello. Hebrews 10, 35. You got to be willing to what? Change. You want to live a good life, you got to be willing to change. Hebrews 10, 35, let's speak it. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of what? Endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. In other words, blessing. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just live by faith and not by taste. Hello? But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in them. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul and of the body. Hello? Praise God. Need of endurance after, after the will to change. In other words, Lord, I'm willing to change. You know, God's going to always say, show me. You can say all the words you want to him. But he's going to say, show me. I know he did that with me. Before he freed me, he said, I, he said guy, do you want to get off of drugs and alcohol or do you want a new life? I had to think about that for a second. So I tried to create my own new life by getting off the drugs and alcohol. It didn't work. So I said, I want a new life. And you know what he said to me? I was expecting something spectacular to happen at that moment. I got a response of, show me. Show me you want a new life. That went on for about a month or two, and then something spectacular happened. Hallelujah. But you got to be willing to change before you can receive the promise of change. Amen? So there's got to be a will to change before you can receive the promise of change. Isaiah 61, and verse 1. What's it say? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now remember, don't, don't lose sight of this. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and to console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so when heaviness comes about, you just start praising God. That they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified, that you and I be called trees of righteousness. Amen? This is a prophecy of the, of the day that Christ would come to proclaim the time of his return in vengeance. God is, God's beginning to release his vengeance. It's the wrath of God that we're going to see very shortly. We will see many people arrested. People are, they, they ain't getting away with this. Even judges. He will release the spirit of death soon. If it hasn't been released already. And the spirit of death will begin to take people out that are refusing to cooperate. In Luke chapter 4, 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, 
And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up and read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. That was not a coincidence, amen? And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, he did not read the rest, but we just read in Isaiah. Does anybody get it? Why? Because it wasn't time yet. Because the next verse is, Vindicate or bring vengeance of our God to the earth. Why? Because it was for a later time. This is the time now. This is the time where Isaiah 61 is being fulfilled. We are in it now. This is the time. This is the latter days. This is it. Amen? There was no vengeance, but it was set for the latter days. This is the latter days, and he's avenging globally as he prepares his people. And I'm going to close in Exodus 12, verse 17. The Lord told Moses, he said, You shall observe the feet of unleavened bread. For on this same day I will, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In other words, there are seven feasts of the Lord. Amen? And these seven feasts, number seven means complete and perfect. These were observed every year, and they still are observed every year. But they can only be fulfilled, even though they're observed, the fulfillment is in Christ Jesus. He came to fulfill all seven feasts, and he's fulfilled the first four. Amen? The next one is called the Feast of Trumpets, which he will fulfill, and that is the removal of the church, the rapture of the church. So he's telling them, come on, I want you to, he's bringing them through the whole, you can read all of, uh, of Exodus 12, talks about all the seven feasts. But I'm specifically talking about this one here. It's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In verse 18, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the, 12th, or the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leaven, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. Now, leaven means it's uh, yeast. Amen? It's yeast. It's fermented. And there are studies that people who spot, in fact, many of, of humanity is bound by yeast big time and yeast eats your immune system it nullifies your brain you can't think quickly amen and what promotes yeast hello sugar sugar feeds yeast and you know what and you can't and what it does is in your intestinal in your intestines the whatever the things that are in it absorb your nutritions they get clogged and you can't because the yeast is on, they're eating it. And people get bloated, or they can get real skinny, or whatever. But anyways, people, it can, causes cancer and all kinds of stuff. So high level, listen, I almost died of it, that's why. I, my, I, there was, I met a doctor that did levels of yeast. My, he, freaked, he freaked out. He said, you shouldn't be alive. Of course, I was doing cocaine and scotch. That's what I lived on. And traveled and did all kinds of stuff. For many years but I began to collapse blackout things of that degree didn't know if I had diabetes cancer they didn't know what the heck was the doctors couldn't help me I had to find somebody that knew what the heck was going on and then he put me on a special diet so forth and man you talk about detox Whew. I was on my hands and knees for days but anyways yeast is a killer and come to find out, almost 99% of the people that are in our mental institutions have a high level of least yeast. So you know how it messes, messes with your mind and your thinking. So what the Lord say? Put them on the yeast fast. No sugar, no yeast for seven days. Why? Because we're going to have to move quickly. Does everybody understand that? Okay. 
He said, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Verse 24, or 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, pick out a lamb, out lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. That's a feast of Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentils of the two doorposts of blood that is on the basin. And, the, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Why? Because the Lord's going to strike the firstborn. He was wanting to release his people. For the Lord will pass through the stri uh, to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. That's why we have the power in the breath of the Spirit to say, I apply the blood of Jesus on myself and my vehicle when I drive. On your homes, on your children. Why? Because the Father acknowledges the blood. Amen? But you've got to be right with God or ain't no activation going to be working, nothing. Amen. Verse 24, and you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you will say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the house of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our household. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel. Go, serve the Lord as you have said. And also take with you your flocks, your herds, and you have said, be gone and bless me. What did he say? And bless me also. This is what Pharaoh said. He freaked out. Everybody was said. He said, man, you can take everything. Go ahead, get out of here. But bless me too. Well, that didn't last long. In verse 33, and the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land of, in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough, hello, before it was what? Leaven. Before it was fermented, yeasted. They didn't put no sugar in it either. Having their kneading bowls upon, uh, bound up on their clothes and on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked for the Egyptians articles of what? Silver, articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that he they granted them what they requested. So they left with gold. They left with silver. They left with the cattle. They left with everything, man. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. This is God's vengeance. This is what's getting ready to happen now. We're going to see some Red Sea moments here. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramsey to Sakoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. And mixed multitude went up with them also, and the flocks and herds, and a great deal of livestock. And they baked unleavened cakes of dough, which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were, they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was four hundred and 30 years. Woohoo! No yeast, no sugar. Amen. Remember, sugar feeds yeast that dulls the mind, thinking, Lord said, Man, I got to cleanse my people. Get it out of your house. Get it out of you. 
In fact, he requires that three times a year, a cleansing. And they left with what? The gold, the silver, the cattle, provisions. Why? Because they could hear. They obeyed. Amen? They obeyed. They didn't understand everything. I mean, come on, they were, you know, they never knew about not having unleavened bread, and all of a sudden they said, no leaven. They didn't know about the feast yet, all of a sudden, we're going to do these feasts, and we're going to do these. And then many of the people, even afterwards, when they were in the wilderness, what did they want to do? They wanted to go back to Egypt. Because they had to rely on God instead of themselves. But I'm telling you, God's vengeance is here. It's trickling. It's going to increase more and more and more and more. And there will be an a economic reset. Everything will be backed by gold and silver. The money, they already have the money printed. It's called, it's a rainbow color of the money. It's representation of covenant. And there's going to be a lot of political people that are no longer going to be political people. They may be, you know, jailers or whatever. Or they may be dead. But God is preparing his children to get in divine order and be prepared. Not get dull-hearted, not get dull-minded. Stay alert. What does this Bible say? The devil, your adversary, the devil seeks you, so you got to be what? Sober. That's alert. Vigilant, consistent in everything that you're doing right now. Because the enemy will wipe you right out. Amen? Look at he's after you. Because you're a danger to him. You know the truth. He's already got the world under control. Now he wants to get the body of, of God under control, the body of Christ. But we're not going to let him. Amen? Because we know the truth. The truth is set us free. And, the, and greater is in us than he, he is in the world. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. If God be for us, we can be against us. Amen? So use the keys to bind and loose. Use those prayer booklets to kick butt and drive out those spirits. The leaven spirits, the sugar spirits, amen, the addictive spirits, the donut spirit, you know. Get them out in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for your glory and your presence. And we promise to give you all the glory and everything you've taught us tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen.